Hello, let's start. Three o'clock. Uh, this is uh, my name is Heiko Weber. Um, this is FEMA tutorial number six. It's about experimental data management in NOMAD. Um, and before starting, I give you a brief schedule of what we plan for today. We have a first hour where we give a presentation first myself, uh, an introductory talk on the science case. And then I will hand over to Shandor Brockhauser, who will be more specific on metadata standardization. We will then have a short break uh, for everyone. Uh, and then 10 after four o'clock, we will start with a, a demo experiment where we start from planning the experiment to building together the experiment, writing software for measuring and finally collecting data. And uh, this will last like 20 minutes or so. And then we have another half a, an hour for a hands-on tutorial on data sharing, visualization, and analysis in NOMAD. And uh, finally, there will be an hour left for questions and answers from your side in particular. Uh, and this is what we plan. Actually, we want to do the full data stream from a software where we start to configure an experiment uh, down to raw data, I'm adding metadata into NOMAD. My name is Heiko Weber, and I'm from Erlangen University, Friedrich Alexander Universität in German. And I'm also working for Fermat, in particular area B and area D, and I will explain this later on. Uh, outline of my talk. Um, I will first talk about the general picture of research data. I will then uh, explain briefly the Fermat approach for making experimental data in solid state physics fair. And then a third chapter is what to do. Let's start with the general picture. There's a good example in history of science about research data. And this is uh, Tycho Brahe, who lived in the 16th century. And over about 20 years, he collected over 20 years uh, high precision data of planetary motion. So he observed the sky without having a telescope, but with this sort of instrument here. And uh, he collected tables, data, and described his data as well. Uh, and uh, in the year 1600, so one year before he died, he hired the young Kepler, who was a bright theorist, say, or a mathematician at the time. And Kepler came to him, but um, after not even one year, as a sudden, Tycho Brahe died and left over his tables, all his data on the planetary motion. And Kepler, actually, uh, who was a little bit younger than him, uh, benefited from all those data, analyzed them over a year, and finally derived from, from Brahe's experimental data the famous Kepler laws, far before Newton and so on. They were published, uh, first part of it was published in 1609 in Astronomia Nu. Okay, without having let his data properly prepared, uh, Kepler would not be uh, enabled, uh, you know, to benefit from all those data from Tycho Price. So That's the first important example of research data and their theoretical use. If we are honest, actually, today's picture is rather uh, like we are not perfectly well prepared that our data residues uh, can be explored. If we look at the guidelines by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, for example, we have rules, uh, and I read them here, in accordance with the rules of good scientific practice, research data should be archived in the research own institution or an appropriate nationwide infrastructure for at least 10 years. Okay, if we archive in our own institution, this looks often like this. Uh, there's a CD, a five-year-old CD from the former doctorate student, which is somewhere lying here. Uh, and it's often not easy to find them, but even if this is well organized, it's often not uh, easy to cope with the data and to understand what data on the CD are meaning what. Well, if you look at publications, there's uh, often a data availability statement uh, that uh, reads, for example, the data that support the findings of this study are available upon reasonable request from the authors. So what would be highly desirable, I would say, is to have a uh, an infrastructure where research data are reliably stored, sorted, 
and uh, can be accessed by everyone. And this is uh, uh, actually a, a trend or, uh, or this, this trend to open data, open research data is embedded in a major trend towards open science that is observable. So if we go back to the 90s, papers were still printed on paper and were accessible in the library. But with the digitalization around, 2000, around the year 2000 or so, we had as a sudden supplementary information in addition to the papers that were electronically observable. We have now open access, which is quite common today, uh, open access to peer-reviewed literature that is often enforced by funding agencies. We have uh, in 2016, um, uh, um, a hallmark actually, this is the formulation of the FAIR principles, um, I will explain this in a few minutes, where it has been uh, claimed that um, uh, the research data have to be organized such that they can really be used uh, later on. And there was also a political statement uh, from the G20 summit in China, where all the uh, uh, presidents, chancellors and so on decided that research data should be uh, uh, stored along FAIR um, principles. Two years ago, there was a strategy paper from the European Commission, which considered data as a resource, in particular research data as well. And this trend is going on and on towards openness in science. Uh, and there's a collection of uh, phenomena, I would say, or concepts uh, that are altogether formulated as open science. I'm not sure whether all this will come, uh, but, uh, for example, uh, one, one thing which is interesting, open notebook science is the claim that we should, while writing our, note, uh, our notes in the notebook, our ideas in the electronic lab notebook, in the lab notebook, it should be made open immediately. This is, I would say, today a little bit too much of what we need, because we need also some protected space. There are interesting concepts that are all um, uh, collected together in this open science con uh, concept, which is also presented by the UNESCO. Well, let's discuss about open data in particular and the underlying principles for open research data. And that's the FAIR principle. And FAIR is an acronym who stands for uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, findable is clear. If I want to deal with research data, I should find them. And uh, there's obviously Google and the internet helping a lot. They should also be accessible. So I don't have to ask anyone. I don't have to uh, pay for it. Uh, there's no technical burden and so on. So it should be accessible briefly. The most difficult part is actually interoperable. Interoperable because uh, interoperable means if I have two measurements of the same type, say two RPS measurements of the same material, uh, then I should be able to compare them immediately. Uh, what is different, what is common to both. And this is um, probably the most difficult talk. And finally, and this is the purpose of all this, they should be reusable. So the data should not be lost, but they should serve, you know, to additional information, perhaps 10 years later, or 20 years later, or whatever. There are some people who uh, claim that, in addition, this FAIR stands also for findable and artificial intelligence ready, which makes the purpose clear for what it should be done. So the idea is, in a few years from now, there should be uh, uh, artificial intelligence which crawls through all the results that we collected over the years, compares them, and in a big data approach, finds new information behind all this data, which was hidden by the individual publications that were published before. Okay, this is how it will be used probably with artificial intelligence, and these are the principles how it should be organized. Let's look at this in an example. Uh, no, no, let's look at the data life cycle, I'm sorry, uh, which is often considered as an element of research data management. Here you see the RDM stands for research data management. Well, what is the data life cycle? It's about organizing um, uh, data uh, such that you plan from the very beginning uh, that they can be uh, used as research data later on. So we start the planning phase. We want to do a new experiment. We start to plan how should we uh, arrange the data? What should we actually collect as data? This is very important, perhaps the most important part. 
Then we start to record raw data. In experimental science, this is the experiment. Okay, along with the raw data, the measured data, actually, we need a description of data acquisition. And this is often termed as metadata. So the description, who has measured? When has it been measured? What has been measured? Perhaps why has it been measured? Which instruments have to be used? Which settings have been used? Which current, which intensity, all these questions, okay? How long was the measurement? How often was it repeated? And so on. These metadata are of equal importance as the raw data. Then typically we do some data processing. We do the science part. So thinking about the data and evaluating the data. We provide a long-term storage in order to keep the data uh, safely. And then typically we publish it. And in the former times after publication, we put them in the shelf, as I said. But now we should prepare for the reusage of data very seriously. And the data lifecycle makes us clear that this has to start from the very beginning, from the planning phase. Uh, we have to collect all these data seriously and also efficiently. Uh, in order to concentrate, be able to concentrate on our, our science. Here's an example. This is a measurement we made uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's called thermoelectricity of near resonant tunnel junctions and their relation to Carnot efficiency. It was published in an open access journal. And uh, actually, we collected, uh, details do not matter, thermoelectricity of molecular junctions. We collected a lot of data. Many of them were you know, not very high quality data, but the entity of data were extremely interesting. Because after 10,000s of such uh, uh, characteristics, we could collect in a, say, big data approach, some information that was hidden by the individual curves, and we found some new physics in. Okay, for today, this is not really important. What is important is this reference number 18, where we said uh, the authors, uh, Pop and Weber, all data, including raw data, is available in an open access repository under DOI number such and such. Okay, so we let all the data, including raw data and also scripts, in an open access repository for 25 years. And this is shown here. It's actually the RADA repository, but this is not really important. Uh, this data set is equipped with the DOI, which is here. Um, and it has been published in 2020, as you can see, and you can download it by pushing on this button here. It will last a minute or so, and then you get all the data, nice directory-wise organized with some metadata, even the scripts, uh, and you can analyze this data. It's nicely referencing also back to the paper, which is not on, on this page, but it's done. And it is a, a, a Creative Commons uh, a license it has, so you can use it, actually. Well, is this, this is a good standard today, and, uh, um, but is it really fair? And the answer is, well, not fully. It is findable, yes, but it's findable if you come from the paper and click on reference 18. Or it is findable via Google, obviously, if you search for the right searching words, thermoelectricity or so. Uh, but the metadata catalog that we have written is probably insufficient. So you cannot find it. You have to, to know the right keywords to find it with Google, I would say. If you don't, you don't find it. And you also know uh, Google has its own opinion on what is important and what is less important, so it will probably not appear on the first row forever. Okay, what would be better if we have a true metadata catalog uh, uh, with many finding words it could find, or it is in a central repository at all? Is it accessible? Yes. You can click on it, you can download it, that's very easy. You don't even authentic have to authenticate yourself. Is it interoperable? No. Actually, the metadata follow our own rules. They might be insufficient because we did our best and wrote down some metadata and description, but uh, it is not what it should be according to the FAIR rules. You, if, if someone else does a second experiment and you start to compare it, then you would say, well, the authors have not fully given all the information which would be necessary to compare it. Scripts are provided. But it's uh, immediate access to the scripts is not possible. You have to download it and to hope that your code, say in 10 years from now, still runs well, uh, the Python code that's, uh, that is delivered with this. 
Is it reusable? Yes, I would say, yes, but the metadata do not meet domain relevant community standards because there are no community standards for this unconventional experiment. Uh, and therefore, it's hard to say whether you can really compare it with other results. You see, I'm self-critical. This is why I put my own, <laughs> my own data here on the forefront. Uh, actually, um, we now go to, this was as to the general picture, we now speak about the Fermat approach for making experimental data fair. Uh, and here you should know, as uh, many of you know, obviously, that we have the Nationale Forschungsdaten Infrastruktur, National Research Data Infrastructure, short NFDE, which has been uh, founded in the last years uh, in three uh, campaigns, actually where the Federation has spent uh, uh, like, or spends like 100 million euro per year on uh, organizing research data. And actually there were consortia uh, which have formed uh, uh, throughout science, um, which try now in their own fields to organize research data appropriately. And in order to mention how uh, different these fields are, you see here engineering, you see uh, something like plant research data, but you see also material remains of human history, like archaeology. And uh, if we look at physics, which is our field, then we have obviously Fermat. And this should be highlighted, but this highlight does not appear. I'm sorry. What's wrong? Now it's here. Uh, Fermat. Uh, which is a fair, for fair data infrastructure for condensed matter physics and the chemical physics of solids. That's our field. In physics, we have also Daphne for NFDI, which is data from photon and neutron experiments for NFDI, so the large facilities say. And we have Punch for NFDI, which is about particles, the universe, and high energy physics in total. Okay, you see, physics is not fully covered. For example, optics or biophysics are not represented in these consortia. These are just specific fields throughout um, science which are funded. Friends of us or close to us are actually also Nat Matwerk, which is an FDE for material science and materials engineering, so engineering oriented. Okay, within our Fermat consortium, um, we have, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we have uh, organized ourselves uh, like this. So this is a graph of the Fermat organization. You see, we have an area A, which is about synthesis and fabrication of solid state uh, of, of, of solids. We have this area B where we are in today. Uh, you see it in the green color here, which is about experimental material science. We have area C, which is about theory, D, digital infrastructure, and then use case demonstrators, outreach and administration as well. Okay, we are today in area B uh, in collaboration with area D, just for your orientation. In order to understand Fermat, it's good to step back for about eight years when the NOMAD repository was, was founded. And this is actually a repository that contains the worldwide largest date, data collection of computed materials data. The idea was at the time to provide a server in Berlin uh, where everyone in the world could upload computed materials data, for example, density functional theory data, uh, could upload it, and then they will be stored and made comparable within the NOMAD repository. Actually, this was uh, NOMAD, I didn't say, it stands for the Novel Material Discovery Laboratory. And this was two years before the claim of the FAIR principles already uh, uh, an initiative which provided fair data. Quite a success story, I would say. So there are, for this sort of computational solid state science, there are about 20, 40 codes in the world which, um, with which you can compute this. And the interesting part of NOMAD is you can upload them all, and they are made comparable by some procedures, by parsing and normalizers. They are converted such that you can really compare the results. There are some 100 million calculations that are uploaded and the selection of them was actually uh, uh, now um, uh, compiled to the so-called Nomad Encyclopedia. So you can now enter into this Nomad Encyclopedia and crawl through all those data. For example, you can say, I'm interested in iron oxides and click on the 
uh, on these elements here. And then a number of uh, materials will show up, like this one where you can say the computed uh, crystal structure and, and, and lattice constant, also the band structure and the density of states and so on. You can collect this from many, many calculations and compare them immediately. So this is quite a success story and it forms the core of the Fermat proposal. But we now want to extend it actually to experiments. And this is a severe task because experiments in solid state physics are much more heterogeneous than these theories that I just presented. Experiments live from instruments and the instrumentation, there are hundreds, thousands of different instruments outside which uh, have to be considered. In solid state physics, sample preparation is of utmost uh, importance. So what actually do you um, uh, investigate and how is it prepared? Sample environment is often important. Is it vacuum? Which vacuum? What conditions? And so on and so forth. Which detectors have been used and what are monitoring quantities? What has been done in terms of data processing? And uh, very tricky is the case of notes, because in many labs we have also handwritten uh, lab notebooks on paper, obviously. And in addition to the difficulties that are inherent in an experiment, um, actually, there's a second difficulty in this field, and this is in comparison to large scale experiments in particle physics, for example, where you have a constant data flow over years and years, solid state physics is extremely heterogeneous. So even in my labs, I have very different machinery, and if I go to the next lab, they have again different machinery, and we all work in small groups. There are three, five, ten people on one publication, so smaller groups as compared to the high energy physics, for example. Therefore, the community is extremely heterogeneous, which is an interesting challenge for us. Well, let's look at this experimental data flow. Um, we are in Fermat, we um, developed the concept how to handle all this data flow since about one year. And I will show you how far we are. We are uh, have a clear concept and we have also, uh, I would say, good first results. Well, solid state physics lives from raw data. I mentioned this, but also from metadata and metadata can collect it in ELNs. ELN stands for electronic lab notebook. Okay, if you have a paper written notebook, obviously you can add your handwritten concepts also to the computer, but it's much more, much easier, say, much more efficient to have from the very beginning an electronic lab notebook. That should be mandatory for a serious research data management. Data analysis stands for all the software, all the scripts that are involved in an experiment, and they should also be uh, saved you know, and maintained. But we focus back on the raw data. What are raw data? How do you collect them? Well, there are at least, I'm sorry, wrong direction. There are at least three con major contributing brands. One is self-written codes. Like in my group, uh, a couple of years ago, there were, to each experiment, there was a code that controlled the experiment and it was written by a former master student doctoral student or whatever so this was self-written code which was often not easy to understand or to modify and uh, there is a big heterogeneity how they stored actually their data into uh, as raw data a little bit more homogeneous might be if you use a consider configurable software like lab view or so uh, but still the output uh, of these data can be very heterogeneous as well. Or if you're one of those physicists that rely predominantly on uh, purchased instruments, where you have the instrument's proprietary software, then it's also not easy to collect all the metadata because the vendors have their own forms of uh, writing, of storing data, and it's not easy to, to, to channel all this together in a raw channel, raw data channel. Okay, we will give some support in this direction by presenting our own config from configurable software tool. Well, the next step is to collect all these together in a common form where we have data and metadata stored together. Okay, not separately, but together. And one proper format for this is the so called HDF5 format, which we have opted. There are others, but uh, this is suitable, I would say, for our purpose to store both data and metadata together. 
So this is an image of the HDA5 web page. Actually, HDA5 is well suited for big data, and it's also well suited for keeping metadata with the data. It has a rather fast input output, can be used across platforms and so on. It's a data format. Okay, let's look at this. We want to collect the data and metadata in a single file, and we choose this HDF5. And for presenting you uh, an HDF5 file, I, I go to this H5 web uh, uh, viewer and look at the data, um, uh, data set, a, da uh, um, um, nah, a file actually that we prepare. It's called Tycho New, and if you look, uh, the user is actually Tycho Pi. Okay, so you can store information about the user. You can store information like it is published at, but you can also, with this metadata, you can also collect the whole data. Like shown here, for example, uh, you see immediately the data, and I go to this declination data here, which are the mass observation data from Tycho Pi. You can see this as a matrix, so the data in columns and so on, or you immediately see the line and, and, and look at this data with these nice uh, tools here. Okay, but this, the, the concept of the HDF5 file, and this is what I wanted to present you, is it's like a directory in your Windows. You can write in uh, a lot of things. Uh, you can also write images like the instrument to your pi used herein and organize this like in a directory independently and immediately work with it. So this is nicely suited for merging metadata and data in a single file. Okay, but what should we write into these files? And this is, uh, uh, and here we have to find rules what to, uh, what to write in and how should we name it? And here we have opted for a systematics that has been defined by the Nexus uh, community. I click on this. That's the Nexus data format web page. Nexus is developed as an international standard by scientists and programmers, uh, blah, blah, blah for the analysis and visualization of neutron, X-ray, and muon data. And we in Fermat decided that this is a good choice for the next ESA to describe our experiments accurately. Nexus provides words and definitions how to describe an experiment. They are laid down, for example, in, I think, 36 uh, base classes. If you click on the base classes, they explain how experimental objects should be uh, described. There is, for example, NX beam. NX stands for nexus, and beam stands for the description of the beam here. Or uh, NX data uh, describes the plottable data and related dimension scales. There's uh, other base classes, NX uh, entry, that describes the measurement. Okay, and with all those base classes, you can, these are building blocks, say, for a description of your experiment or my experiment. And if we have a specific experiment in mind, let's say ARPES, Angular Resolve Photo Emission Spectroscopy, we have to make an application definition. Application definition says, what is the information I need for describing a concrete experiment? For example, ARPES. And there's an NX ARPES in which it is collected what we should write down if we want to describe an ARPES experiment. Shandor later on will go in more depth in this. Finally, if we have standardized our data output uh, accordingly, we can feed it into NOMAD. And within NOMAD, this is the server, we can search, visualize, and, and uh, analyze um, the data. And it serves also as a repository for later on. Well, um, not everything will be immediately loaded onto the central nomad server in Berlin, but we can also have an Oasis nomad. So this is a local copy of the nomad server, for example, here in Erlangen, we just installed one. And this means if we do the experiment in Erlangen and we have our local server, we can upload the data here, do everything I just, I'm just presenting here in this local Oasis server and, uh, uh, and work with it. And once we decide now it should be published, we can put it on the full public Nomad server. Well, what should we do um, in order to, uh, to make these goals uh, available for everyone? And uh, I would like to start actually with the physics students. 
Uh, here in Erlangen, uh, we had the insight that for modern physics, data competences are extremely important, like in other, many other places, obviously. But um, they, I would say they are as important as experimental skills, mathematics, and so on. But here in Erlangen, we decided some three years ago to make a programming course in Python mandatory in the first semester. So this is instead of uh, Anfänger Praktikum, so beginner's lab course, uh, we have some lessons in programming in Python, which changes the whole curriculum, I would say, because they start immediately with numerical competences. And this is further um, uh, confirmed by our lab courses, which in the third semester run with an electronic lab notebook from the so in the third semester and later on. This has many, I would say, positive implications for teaching in science. Uh, let's look into the electronic lab notebook we use in the lab course. Actually, you see here uh, just a snapshot uh, of this OpenBiz uh, uh, ELN, where you see we have day one. Uh, I apologize, it's in German, but this is how our, our lab course is in German. We have an experimental description, which is there. This is the task they have to do, and then they can add information. For example, here a screenshot of the oscilloscope. And the students are obviously quite capable in adding all this uh, to the paper. They can also then add uh, tables or spreadsheets when they start to measure something. These are filled in, you know, with a mouse and by hand with, uh, with a keyboard. Uh, actually, this table has then uh, a permanent ID. Uh, and if you know this permanent ID, you can access this data with Python with a one line code. So if they are at home, they can collect all this data from the cloud, say, compute with their own Python code, uh, make analysis, and pump it back to this electronic network. Okay, and like this, they learn a lot. Actually, they uh, share the same lab notebook and work actively within the lab book. Um, they have a Python-based uh, numerical analysis. They do Python-based numerical analysis and visualizations. For us, us as organizers, it's actually very efficient. Uh, but we learn also how to organize ELN sufficiently. And for us, it's actually an interesting sandbox because um, lab course runs 10 weeks. And with these 10 weeks, we can try out something which works good. You know, as always, something works good, something works uh, not so good. And we learn a lot actually from these experiences. For the whole university, for the department, say, uh, it's also a benefit because the students bring along ELN and data competences when they come into the bachelor courses already. So this is an interesting prerequisite, I would say, to let all the people contribute to our data concepts, to teach the people, uh, to teach the students early in their career. Well, electronic lab notebooks are key because they collect all the metadata ideally, okay? I have here two or three uh, actually labels of open access uh, electronic lab notebooks. There's OpenBIS, eLab FTW is very popular. Uh, but also can motion, but more important, and I should say there's a tutorial on electronic lab notebooks, uh, which was recorded in March, and you can still look at it on YouTube and so on. But more important than the choice of ELN is that you have really a good internal structure, uh, which is able to not only to uh, channel the information that you write in, such that it's easy for, for everyone to, to fill the electronic lab notebook with the important information, but also it should be uh, structured such that you can feed the data further into this pipeline towards the NOMA. Okay, and this is why we support the community by adding uh, to the NOMAD and to the OASIS server, I just mentioned the local one, an electronic lab notebook, which is uh, evolving and which uh, should be quite convenient actually uh, to implement the workflow of a solid state physicist uh, such that is easily uh, transferred into this channel. And as to the raw data, we contribute the CAMEL software, which we will introduce later, which is an easy access also to generate raw data, which have already Nexus similar or Nexus ready uh, standards. Well, let's look at uh, research area B again, which is about the Fermat project, where we have five pilot experiments. One of them is, for example, angle resolved photo emission. Others are atom probe tomography, electron microscopy, optical spectroscopy, core level spectroscopy. Let's look at this photo emission spectroscopy. 
for such uh, for these pilot projects, actually, we prepare everything pretty well. Okay, and we try to exercise uh, all uh, our concepts uh, thoroughly. So what happens? Actually, we have here the experiment and the detector. The detector collects the raw data, but there are also automatic metadata, instrument settings, and so on and so forth, and electronic logbook. All these data can be fed into the NOMAD server after all. But how? Actually, the standards are defined by the Nexus standards. I've introduced these base classes like beam, entry data, and so on. And an application definition means that we sort out all these words we have to define for describing photoelectron spectroscopy uh, properly, okay? And let's say accurately. And once we have defined this application definition, which is quite some work and needs also agreement of the whole community that this is now properly done, uh, then we can say now we write all this information well sorted in, within the rules of application definition into NOMAD where it forms a Nexus file according to the rules, like uh, similar to the to supply, like uh, one I just showed you. It is checked for compatibility. Now we have it inside Nomad, and Nomad provides a surface to work now with it. Okay, for example, there's the HDF5 view where, where you have a different visualization, which are well adapted for RPES spectroscopy. Or you use the Python RPES, which you can run also here and do your own evaluation scripts uh, uh, on data slicing, peak fitting, Fermi edge correction, whatever, whatever you want to do, filtering and so on, you can run this. And you can also add information to the electronic logbook uh, uh, inside here. And all this is then stored coherently in a data file. And if you want and say, now I'm ready for publication, then you have the data perfectly prepared with all the metadata available within Nomad already. Okay, let's go for today's example, because today's example is not this well-established method. Today's example is a simple one, I should say, but it's when you start a new experiment and you start from scratch. Perhaps you have no application definitions yet, uh, but you have no software yet which writes all this. And we want to make an example how this can be efficiently organized by using our module CAMELS, which you will see in a moment. We do then the experiment measure raw data and pump them properly into NOMAD such that they are fair after all. And uh, this is again in this workflow you can say well I have an experiment like this one. This is not the one you will see later but this is the one I presented before. You can still collect if, if it's not yet re registered, if it's not perfectly elaborated, if there's no application definition prepared, you can still do your best make a very simple application definition, which just collects the instrumental data that you know, the sample ID and the user perhaps. This you can also write uh, into this. Then you have a uh, description which runs the same pathway into NOMAD. Although the method is not perfectly defined, you can work with it, okay? It's nearly perfectly fair, I would say, because the community has not agreed on what is required for this method, but it works. You can use NOMAD nevertheless. You can use the data, you can run Jupyter notebooks and make Python operations, whatever. You have the electronic log logbook available. You can use this and prepare it for fair data. And this is what will be shown later on. Why should we care about all this? Actually, there are two good reasons. The first I want to mention, to be honest, we will be forced to do so. Because all major funding agencies endorse the fair concepts, and we have to do it in the near future. That's one good reason to do so. But I'm actually convinced that we and our research will also benefit from it because the openness and transparency provides credibility. And uh, it will reduce fraud, overstretched interpretations, et cetera. And uh, I would say those who will not uh, deliver open data will be somehow mistrusted uh, at a given point. This will open your data to new communities. It is actually unlikely that you utilize the full information content of your data. So this gives you perhaps additional uh, citations and so on and so forth. It will trigger collaborations and it will prepare the ground for AI based science in the near future. So this means comparison of large uh, experimental data, a systematic uh, um, artificial intelligence driven science. 
And obviously it will boost careers because the same requirements are also in industry and in banking and so on and so forth. So uh, whether you're still in science or outside, these data competence is, is extremely important uh, in the future. Altogether, I'm convinced it makes science better by making the process of extracting knowledge from data fully transparent, reproducible, and transferable. I'm actually happy to contribute as an early mover to this transition, I would like to say. Okay, that's it for today. Um, I'm beautifully in plan. Actually, I promised to do it within 40 minutes. And now I hand over to Shandor Brockhauser, who will be more specific on metadata standardization.